Hopkinton viewers, welcome to Veterans Remember, a ongoing series of one-on-one -on -one discussions with Hopkinton individuals who have served in our military. We're doing this from the comfort of HCAM Studios on Main Street. I'm Hank Alessio, pleased to be the moderator of this session. The discussions are a journey in our history. They are an opportunity to learn of military experiences spanning from World War II on through the current Gulf conflict. Our men and women have worn uniforms in peacetime and some in combat. They've served all over the United States, in Europe, North Africa, the Far East, and they've served in every branch of service. I might add, this information cannot be found in books. You will hear about our town's rich heritage directly from the grassroots experiences of military personnel. The stories they'll tell us shed light in a small way on how they shaped our nation and more importantly, how the military impacted their lives. Hopefully, the recorded sessions will be building in our educational context, context in our libraries and schools and remain in uh, the, I'm sorry, the HCAM memorabilia room 24-7. In my opinion, future generations, your grandchildren, will think the world of these sessions. Veterans Remember is fortunate to be able to document the story in the United States Army of Edward F. O'Leary, a Hopkinton resident for over 50 years. Ed, welcome to Veterans Remember. And thank you for your generous time in sharing your story with us. You and I represent a growing number of people that cannot say we're townies. How did you breach the gate and come to Hopkinton? How did your early life evolve into being in the military? Well, I grew up in Holliston. My our uh, father was a life, uh, lifelong uh, member of the Holliston community, and my mother was from Framingham, and I grew up in Holliston and went to high school in Framingham, and uh, went to college in Cincinnati, went to Xavier University in Cincinnati, and while at Xavier, I uh, was in the ROTC. Now, Xavier was a land-grant school, and two years of ROTC were mandatory. So after the first two years, I opted to stay in and, and get the commission. And uh, as well as getting paid for the last two years, it wasn't much, but we got paid something. Uh, anyway, after graduation, uh, I had to go, I graduated in I guess June or, yeah, June, call it, 1956. In January 57, I went on active duty. Uh, my first, uh, first location was Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And it was January and the streets were pretty slippery, but I got out there all right. And I had three months of officer's basic training in Fort Sill. And then my, uh, my duties uh, began in Fort Lewis, Washington in the 4th Division, the 4th Infantry Division. I was an artillery officer and uh, I was there three days at Fort Lewis and I was told that uh, we were going to California. I had recently got married on the way out to Fort Lewis and I was told that uh, we were going to California, to Camp Roberts, California. 
and train the California National Guard. Uh, be, be, before we <clears throat> go to California, Ed, can we go back to Xavier and tell our younger viewers particularly a little bit about ROTC. What would be a, a day or a week in the experience uh, being an ROTC candidate? Well, the first two years at this particular school, uh, Xavier, uh, it was an hour of classroom the first, in the first two years, every week, one hour a week in the classroom <coughs> and one hour drill on Friday. And you were measured for a uniform and on Friday, uh, the whole school showed up in military uniform. Uh, the last two years, which was optional, uh, it was a, an hour a day, five hours a week, but one of those hours was also the drill on Friday. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's what it, it took mm -hmm. to stay in the ROTC at the school I went to. Very good. And you had other family members that were in the military too. Yes. Uh, my brother Dick was in the military. He was in the combat engineers. He served overseas. Uh, my brother Bob was in the Navy. He was a, uh, a naval reservist at Weymouth and got activated and spent uh, two years on the uh, the, the Roosevelt, the aircraft carrier Roosevelt, and it went all over the world uh, and got out in two years. And uh, I have a grandson at the moment that's in the Rhode Island National Guard, and I have a son-in-law who was a West Point grad, and my son Brian is also a West Point grad. And uh, Brian has uh, just got home from Kuwait. Uh, it's his third trip over there. Mm -hmm. And he lives in New Hampshire these days. He, he got married and left Hopkinton. Yeah. It sounds like a very patriotic family. <laughs> Congratulations. Now we can go to California. <laughs> Camp Roberts, was it? Yes, yeah. Pretty dry out at Camp Roberts. Uh, in fact, it was so hot and dry that the parade field was off limits during daylight hours. Uh, you couldn't even look across the parade field because of the, the heat emanating from the pavement. Wow. It was a hot place. Yeah. And, and uh, I was there three months or thereabouts and uh, never saw a drop of dew, uh, never saw a cloud. In three months. Weekends, we used to go to the ocean. We'd go to Pismo Beach or Avila Beach or some beach and get cooled off in the ocean. But uh, while you were at Camp Roberts, it was hot and dry. Well, you uh, being an artillery officer, <clears throat> I don't know if the viewers are as uninformed as I was. Could you help us understand a gun versus a howitzer versus a mortar and what they do. Okay, uh, I was uh, in a mortar battery, a 4.2 inch mortar battery, which uh, had just changed over from infantry to artillery as I reported to Fort Lewis. Uh, the new Pentomic Army was uh, battle groups and no longer companies. And uh, I was in the, uh, a mortar battery, a 4.2 inch mortar battery. Now, the difference between howitzers, howitzer is, a, is an elevated weapon that shoots high and can get over hills and, and uh, drop in on, on troops uh, behind the hills. A gun is longer than a howitzer, that is the barrel is longer, but uh, it, it shoots straight and it takes uh, more power. To, and the mortar is uh, more like the uh, howitzer, it shoots high. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the artillery had a little trouble bore sighting 
the uh, mortars. Uh, it wasn't really an artillery piece. It, it uh, was an infantry piece. Uh, and I understand since I left the service after two years that the 4.2-inch uh, mortar has gone back to the infantry. And I gather when you're in uh, your active duty mode, you can meet some crusty old individuals. Uh, you told me a story once that might be good to repeat. Oh, I had a sergeant that was, he said he was born and raised in the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. And he used to, uh, he used to compare distances to uh, what he remembers around his hometown. And he'd tell you that uh, the place you're going to is two axle greases and a chicken dinner from the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> he, was a, he was an old codger, that guy. Well, I hope Henry, he was a, Henry Studebaker, his name was. I hope he was a good sergeant in your battery. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was infantry. We, we had the job of uh, just, the, just the officers were artillery. Uh, all the troops were still infantry. And uh, we, had some, we had some hurdles to get over, mm -hmm. uh, training the troops to, to do it like the artillery does it. Well, I'm sure you could have handled that one. <laughs> we worked at it. So were, th were there any uh, specific or interesting events at Camp, Camp Roberts, any exercises? Or is that all later at Fort Lewis? Uh, the exercises that we were directly involved in were all back at Fort Lewis. Uh, we <coughs> just complemented the California National Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, taught some classes, uh, but no, uh, no maneuvers. Mm -hmm. The maneuvers were all back at Fort Lewis, mm -hmm. out in the woods of Washington. Well, Fort Lewis certainly has quite a reputation. Uh, big infantry division still there, I gather. Uh, I'm not sure what's there yeah. today. Yeah. But the 4th Division was there, and, and the commanding general was uh, Quinn. They called him Buffalo Bill Quinn. Mm -hmm. And he got his, he made it a strack division, which means that uh, it was on the West Coast and capable of being first in a war zone. And we were the first to go, in other words. Uh, Bill, Buffalo Bill Quinn got his promotion to the Pentagon. And Harry Truman's uh, relative, a guy named Truman, General Truman, was then the commander of the 4th Division. And things went fairly smooth under, mm -hmm. under Truman. It was, it was good. Mm -hmm. And did your job change much going from Roberts to Lewis? Well, uh, at Lewis, I was in the 1st Battle Group, 8th Infantry, and it was a, uh, instead of a, a battery, it was a battle group. And uh, I was a platoon leader in the mortar battery, and uh, we spent most of the time getting ready. Uh, we were on maneuvers just about all the time. Every week it was three, four nights out in the boondocks. Yeah. And uh, we didn't have much ammunition. Occasionally, we set up to fire. But uh, most of the time, it was just uh, maneuvers, just mm -hmm. uh, no, no bullets. Mm -hmm. Dry runs. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I gather all your training and maneuvers at uh, Fort Lewis uh, worked their way to a, a culmination in, in your second year. Yes, they did. Uh, we were activated uh, for Kui Moi and Matsu. Uh, this is a case where the nationalist China was bombarding with artillery and airplanes, I understand, uh, the islands of Formosa and Kui Moi and Matsu that belonged to Formosa. And uh, we were uh, alerted, uh, and we had a bunch of trucks that were uh, three-quarter ton Dodge trucks 
that were the prime movers for the motor battery, but they were deadlined because of an austerity program, and they were deadlined for a, a six or seven dollar flexible fuel line. And uh, we towed them on the flat cars. And now this is while the alert was active. Uh, we didn't leave the base. Uh, we didn't ever go to get on a ship. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what happened in Kuimoi and Matsu, but they, I guess they stopped bombing over there and, and the alert was called off. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a, a pretty big thing at that time. I, I can remember it myself in the news. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about uh, your Rocky Shoals exercise. Okay. That Ex sounds interesting. Exercise Rocky Shoals was uh, supposed to be the largest peacetime maneuver up to that time, up to that point. And now this is 1958. And uh, we loaded on ships, the whole division loaded on ships out of Seattle. And we spent uh, maybe a week in the Pacific, and the Pacific was very angry. And uh, we were supposed to storm the beaches at San Simeon, California. Uh, we were late doing it because of the Pacific. And I remember coming over, I was on the APA Cavalier, and I remember coming down the rope ladders and getting in an LCM, but the, the LCM uh, was not always in the same place. It would be way below you for one minute, and suddenly it's uh, approaching, coming up the side of the ship, and you had to scramble back up the ladder. Anyway, we got on the LCM, and the LCM couldn't land for a few days. We were on the LCM, I think, a day and a half before we finally hit the beach. Mm. And uh, then we uh, went on to Hunter Liggett Military Reservation. And I had been at Hunter Liggett when I was at Camp Roberts the year before. And uh, I knew a little bit about Hunter Liggett. But anyway, we. We uh, went through the maneuvers on Hunter Liggett and uh, back on the ships. We reloaded in San Simeon and uh, back to Seattle. And it, the whole thing took about three months. Plus, uh, I was involved in, in the S3 at uh, Brigade uh, for the planning sector of it, and that took two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. So uh, altogether, it was about two or three months. Yeah. Well, to give our viewers an idea of how big this big civilian time uh, operation was, the number of uh, Army, Marines, and Navy that were involved uh, would equate to the population of Hopkinton. So if you can imagine all of Hopkinton sitting there in the water. Yeah, yeah. And these ships you talk about uh, were hundreds of feet long. Yes. Hundreds of feet, yes. and could they fit in Lake uh, Whitehall? Uh, not hardly. No, not hardly. No, uh, there were a lot of ships. I don't remember how many, but hunt, uh, maybe forty or mm -hmm. sixty, or and uh, they were big ships. Mm -hmm. Many were the Cavalier that I was on was probably a five or six hundred foot ship. Wow, and. Uh, it was a troop ship, uh, and uh, I was on it longer than I like to realize. In fact, uh, we used to sneak out nights uh, or in the evening after the meal and uh, just watch the Pacific. And you could see some of the other ships in the convoy, and they were tossing and turning, and, <laughs> and uh, they, they, one, one LST had uh, two and a half ton trucks on the deck lashed to the deck and that thing would go over so far that when it righted uh, the water would run out of the truck on the deck yeah it would submerge the trucks well if you didn't take ROTC you never would have experienced <laughs> that in Hopkinton yeah, yeah true was there anything else in uh, your uh, Fort Lewis career? Because you were now 
are getting towards the end of 58 when your two years are yeah. up. Uh, anything noteworthy? Well, went through, uh, while I was a uh, platoon leader, we went through battery tests, uh, had a couple of them, and uh, we, uh, I was, uh, I had the first platoon and, and a fellow that was in OBC with me at Fort Sill had the other platoon, the firing platoon. There was a headquarters platoon that we didn't have much to do with. But uh, between the two of us, we, we did pretty well with the battery tests. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were pretty strict. Uh, they were after keeping this division, a strack division, and, and uh, mm -hmm. they wanted everybody to know it. Mm -hmm. It was highly publicized. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, how did the end of your active duty uh, evolve and now that you're done with that big maneuver at uh, yeah, Fort well, Lewis? Well, it wasn't too long after the maneuver was over that I was up uh, to get out. Uh, my two years were up. And uh, I remember uh, Lieutenant Kirk, his name was Kirk, came into the brigade headquarters one day and he said the general wants to see you in this jeep out back. So I went out the back door and General John H. McGee was the general and he's sitting in his jeep. He said, get in O'Leary. <laughs> so I get in the back seat and away we went, stopped in a parking lot. He turned around and he said, how come you're getting out? Why are you leaving? He said, we're after, we're trying to keep people in this division and, and it seems like you and some of the others are leaving. Well, I said, I, I had a job before I came in and I'm going back to the same job. I said, it's waiting for me. That's why I'm getting out, mm -hmm. so. So he didn't quite get you in a headlock to re-up. Huh? No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. He was a, he was a uh, survivor of the Bataan Death March. Oh, yeah, he gosh. was in the Philippines during World War II. Boy, God bless him. Yeah, John H. McGee, his name was. And then after, uh, after then, your, your uh, tour of duty is up, you returned to Hopkinton, to Framingham? Well, I returned to Holliston oh. because we didn't have a place. My wife was from Illinois and we didn't have a place up here and I stayed, we stayed with my folks on Highland Street in Holliston and uh, after about a month and a half we uh, were looking for a house and we found one in Hopkinton and we moved to Hopkinton that summer. Uh, well it was before summer, it was probably April or May, mm -hmm. we moved to Hopkins. We, well, that's uh, good. We're all better off for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and we moved once. We moved to Curtis Road uh, a year and a half later, and we've been at Curtis Road since 1960. Mm -hmm. Very well, it strikes me uh, that uh, whether it's you or the O'Leary family, uh, are very driven by getting good educations and uh, patriotic to have so many of you spend a long time in the military and your one son and one grandson are still in. Yeah. You could have stayed in. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, uh, that's a wonderful testament. And for our younger viewers, uh, I think it's a good, uh, some good advice to at least investigate ROTC because today you can get your entire tuition paid. In our day, it was yeah. a, a couple of bucks a month. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I know uh, we have a couple of nephews that got full rides uh, in ROTC. So it's not for everybody, but it should at least be a, a consideration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ed, thank you for helping create another successful Veterans Remember visit. Your experiences will stand proudly in Hopkinton's recorded history and be a strong building block for our grandchildren to learn firsthand more about our American military. 
and viewers should remember that uh, all veterans remember discussions can be seen 24-7 on HCAM TV. Uh, you can visit our men and women at www.hcam.tv slash veterans remember. And if you know anyone who would be a good guest, a good prospect of being a guest, please let the people at HCAM know or let myself know. Uh, we'd love to have them. And uh, I'm delighted that we had this opportunity with Ed. And for the next time, thank you for being with us. Ed, thank you. Thank you.